going. We're on a tight schedule here. We've got exactly one hour, and we've got three fantastic presenters. Um, and we're hoping to get a little bit of interaction in between as well, so we'll see what we can do. My name is Mark Trombley. I'm from the Healthy, Active Living and Obesity Research Group at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario uh, Research Institute in, uh, in Ottawa. Jean-Philippe Chapu, uh, also from the same spot, is co-chairing with me. So welcome. You picked a great session. Um, the way it's going to be, we have three presenters. So they've got roughly 20 minutes each. We've asked them each to speak for a little bit less than that so we can try and get a question or two in between. There'll be no time for a panel at the end, but after an individual presentation, if time permits, we'll have a question uh, or two. And if you're asking the question, please introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you're from, and ask a short, tight little question, not, not a monologue, please. Um, so our first presenter um, is Catherine Walton. Catherine is a PhD candidate in the Department of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition at the University of Guelph. Her research interests focus on factors uh, in the general home environment that may increase risk of obesity among young children. Her master's research focused on the association between parenting stress and obesity risk related behaviors uh, among children, including reducing physical activity uh, and increased screen time. Title of her presentation is Parenting Stress Associations with Childhood Obesity physical activity, and TV viewing. Please join me in welcoming Catherine. Welcome, thanks for coming to my session. Um, I am Catherine Walton and I'm from the University of Guelph and I'm talking today about something that I feel really passionate about and that's supporting parents and helping their um, promote healthy behaviors among their young children. Um, so I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, some of the research that I'm going to present to presenting today was funded by the American Heart Association. Um, Dr. Jess Gaines is the PI on that, but otherwise there's no um, competing interests and I have no bias to present. Um, so I would like to acknowledge my research team and that's my advisor, Dr. Jess Haynes and Drs. Gerardo Darlington and Janice Randall Simpson from the University of Guelph. I would also like to thank the participants of the Parents and Tots Together program in Boston and the data collection team at Harvard um, Pilgrim Health Center and the obesity prevention program at Harvard Medical School. Um, so during my talk today, I'll talk about um, what parenting stress is and what we know about the association between parenting stress and child weight outcomes. I'll also share some analyses looking at parenting stress, child weight, child behavior, and parent limit setting, and some implications for practice and maybe some practical things um, to take away. Okay. So among preschoolers, um, we know that there's certain behaviors that um, can increase the risk for excess weight gain, and that includes poor dietary intake, including sugar-sweetened beverage consumption, uh, poor sleep habits, um, decreased physical activity, and increased sedentary activity, including screen time. However, during the um, early years, parents are actually the uh, major influencing factor in young children's lives, and so I think it's really important to also consider um, some things, um, parental factors that may include increased childhood risk, and that includes um, parents' ability to model healthy behaviors, um, their parent feeding practices, and their parenting style, um, to name a few. And so parent-specific stress um, is characterized by a complex construct representing a combination of parent, child, and family characteristics as they relate to a person's appraisal of his or her role of a parent. And in the literature, there's no one clear definition of stress, and that's because everybody has different thresholds for stress. What stresses me out may not stress someone else out, and everybody has different coping mechanisms. And so it's not well-defined. Um, and so when we think about parenting stress specifically, um, this is the major definition. However, the literature does use many different types of parenting stress. Um, and the key aspect of this is that it may disrupt um, normal um, parent-child relationships um, long term. And so I think if we think about parenting, there is a, a, a normal amount of stress to parenting. Um, and depending on your child's behavior on a certain day and that type of thing, um, there can be stress. But this is long-term stress. So this is stress that day after day, um, you are sort of reconsidering your role as a parent. How am I doing? Am I doing a good job? Um, and that's inhibiting uh, parent-child relationships. 
So this is a very um, basic diagram for something that's actually quite complex, but when we think about parenting stress and how it relates to childhood obesity, we have stressors, um, neuroendocrine responses, and then behavioral effects, and they all interact together. Um, and so we have stressors in the short term, so parenting stress, um, you know, maybe your child's having a temper tantrum in the grocery store at that very moment in time, quite stressful. Um, but in this in this time, um, we're talking about long-term stress. So this is not something um, that um, goes away. And so what we find is that enhanced levels of cortisol over the long term actually cause neuroendocrine um, changes, um, including insulin and leptin resistance, and that can increase or um, affect behaviors. And so in this presentation specifically, we're focusing on um, increased sedentary activity, specifically screen time and TV time, and decreased physical activity. However, um, we see changes in appetite, we see changes in sleep behavior as well, but for this presentation, we'll focus on the sedentary activity. So the literature suggests that parenting stress leads to increased obesity risk among young children in two ways. And it, parenting stress itself, so the high levels of cortisol that parents experience, may actually activate the child's own response to stress. So their cortisol levels are also high, and then we see those neuroendocrine changes. The second is that parenting stress may lead to parenting that unintentionally promotes unhealthy behaviors or limits parents' abilities to model those healthy behaviors. And so stress may culminate in a lack of time spent in the ch with children, which causes higher um, physiological stress among the young children, resulting in high higher obesity risk through those neuroendocrine um, changes. And parenting stress may also influence children's weight-related behaviors. So parents experiencing higher levels of stress um, may lack the time or energy to be physically active with their children, um, or they may find that the TV or screen time acts as a good babysitter during times of high stress or when the parent needs to get work done. And so when we think about the guidelines for young children, I think it's important to consider parenting stress because we see a lot of children aren't meeting some of these guidelines around healthy behaviors. So figuring out why that is and how we can support parents is important. So what do we know? Um, a, few studies have or a few studies have actually examined the association between parenting stress and um, specifically in child weight outcomes. So we see some studies look at um, things like marital stress or um, financial stress. Um, but not specifically stress related to parenting. Um, and so there was a recent um, meta-analysis by Tate et al. that found that children um, are at greater risk of obesity when their mothers are stressed regardless of the type of stress. Um, so parenting stress was explored, but across um, study designs, um, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally, parenting stress was increased or was associated with that increased risk. And O'Connor and colleagues um, actually just published about two weeks before this presentation, um, a systematic review found consistent evidence that parenting stress um, influences child weight-related activities, specifically to TV viewing and sedentary activity. They didn't find a strong relationship with um, aspects of dietary um, intake. And I think an important thing to think about with parenting stress is it's shown to be mutable. So we can change parenting stress. Um, research looking at parenting with children with chronic disease um, or um, children with behavioral problems, we found that you can actually um, decrease parenting stress and that leads to more increased positive parenting and positive child outcomes. And so when we think about other types of stress, like financial stress, in a research setting or a clinical setting, it's not necessarily so easy to, to change that type of stress, but we know that parenting stress is mutable. So this brings me to the rationale of some of our analyses. Um, so general parenting behaviors or practices that are not um, directly related to weight-related behaviors, such as parenting stress, may increase um, children's obesity risk. And we know that childhood um, obesity is multifactorial. There's many behaviors that play into it. And when we think about children, we really can't see them as a silo. Um, children must, as family system theory says, children must be looked at um, as embedded in the environment within their raised. And so I think that the stress in the home is um, a valid point um, to look further into. Okay, so our study had two objectives. Um, the first was to look directly at parenting stress and child body mass index using the World Health Organization um, BMIZ uh, curves. And the second was to look at parenting stress uh, and TV viewing hours, um, parental limits on TV, so do parents um, set limits at all, and then physical activity. Um, in the second um, models there, it was all based on parent report. Um, 
and TV viewing was measured in hours per day. Uh, parent limit was a yes or no question, and physical activity was um, parent report of uh, minutes per day. Um, and we did dichotomize TV viewing based on the American Academy of Pediatric recommendations that children between the ages of two and five watch less than two hours of TV per day. And for physical activity, we used a cutoff um, either meeting the guidelines of 60 minutes of active play or not meeting those 60 minutes. Um, and so the, the participants work on the Parents and Tots Together program, and this was baseline, so this was cross-sectional, and I think that's important to note when we look at some of the results. We had 110 parents of preschoolers between the ages of um, two to five, and parenting stress was measured using the Parenting Stress Index, short form, and specifically the Parent Distress Subscale. So looking specifically at um, distress, so high levels of parenting distress, and an example of a question was, having a child has caused more problems in my relationship with my spouse, male or female friend, than I had expected. So re as a result of being a parent, um, in things that have changed in um, the parent's life. Um, so here briefly I'll go through some of our um, uh, results in terms of demographics. Most of our uh, parent participants in the Parents and Tots Together program were mothers. 75% were married or living with a partner. 40% had not graduated high school. 64% had a total yearly income of less than $45,000 US uh, per year. And we did have um, a diverse um, race and ethnicity represented. So I'm going to highlight a few results here. So the Parents and Tots Together program is a, um, a prevention intervention. And so um, ch uh, children at any weight status, parents at any stress level um, were welcome. Anyone that wanted to sign up could come. So I think it's important to note that only 20% of parents were categorized as experiencing high levels of parent distress. And we had um, about 50 or just less than 50% of our children um, were considered overweight or obese. If we look at some of the health behaviors, um, in terms of physical activity on weekdays, um, most of our children were meeting that, those recommendations of at least 60 minutes of active play per day, so 67%. On weekend days, it was a little bit higher, so perhaps families have more time to spend together on weekends at 73%. Um, child TV viewing, most of our children were not meeting the recommendations in terms of less than two hours of TV time per day on both weekend and weekday, and they're fairly similar at 50 and 53%. And most parents said yes to setting limits around TV time. So we ran logistic regressions um, here, and all of our models were adjusted for um, parent marital status and educational attainment. Um, we didn't see an association between parenting uh, distress and child weight status in this sample. Um, but what we did see was that the ch um, children with stressed parents were less likely to have limits set around the amount of TV that they watch. And we did see that children on weekdays were less likely to meet the physical activity guidelines, um, but not on weekend day, or weekend days were, looked much better. Okay, so we didn't find an association between parenting stress and child weight, and that is consistent with um, some of the literature. There is mixed results in terms of the association with parent-specific stress, and I think that's because of the way um, that it's measured. Um, and general life stress itself may have a stronger influence on um, child weight status and parent-specific status. So there's thoughts that perhaps parent-specific status doesn't um, raise parent cortisol levels or maybe it doesn't raise the children's cortisol levels enough for them to experience those neuroendocrine um, changes that may lead to excess weight gain. Um, but parenting stress is an underlying factor that may be associated with some unhealthful behaviors in young children. And so we think about why children aren't meeting some of our health behavior recommendations. Um, it may be warranted to look um, further into the home environment, um, specifically at parenting stress and how we may support parents. So I have a few practice points, and I hope that these are maybe practical in terms of how we can support parents, because I think that's really, really important. And I come from a, a prevention background, and the Parents and Tots Together program was um, prevention, but I think even in um, treatment settings, um, we can think about how stress may increase um, when you're told, these are the things you need to do to help your child um, have a healthy um, outcomes in life, and it can be stressful. So I think for parents to successfully model healthy behaviors, it's really important to consider the well-being of the parent themselves. So how well is the home environment doing before we can go ahead and make some changes? And s perhaps referrals are needed before families are ready to make some of those healthy behaviors or changes. 
I think it's also important to consider the role that the TV plays in the home surrounding stress. And so we saw that most children in our study weren't meeting the, physical, or the TV guidelines. Um, and actually, the average, um, I didn't show this actually, but um, children were watching about three and a half hours of TV per day or screen time. And we had children watching upwards of seven hours. So if you think going from seven hours down to two, that's quite unrealistic. So I think um, being very family centered and tailoring care to the families and meeting them where they're at, even small reductions can be um, very powerful. Um, and also thinking about how different intervention messages can be um, given to families where they potentially struggle the most. So we saw a difference between physical activity on weekend days and weekdays. And so the weekdays maybe need um, stronger intervention messages around um, getting out after work and that type of thing um, if it's possible for families. And Promoting these behaviors themselves may actually decrease stress. And so it's kind of a two birds with one stone situation. Um, if we can get families to engage in some of these healthy behaviors, um, we may actually see a reduction in parenting stress. Okay. And so some directions for future research. I think that these, um, this is one of the, uh, a small body of literature examining parenting stress, but I think it's important. Um, our families were attending a nine-week parenting program. This was baseline data, but they signed up for the program to attend for nine weeks. And so I think exploring parenting stress in families that aren't attending a parenting program, haven't self-selected for that, is important. Um, so in clinical settings, potentially, um, we could look at that. And I think looking at objective measures of parent and child stress is important. Um, while parent report is uh, a valid thing because as I said, um, you know, we all experience stress differently. So if I identify that I'm feeling stressed, that is important. But in terms of how it affects the child, um, taking the actual cortisol levels, um, and not just um, cross-sectionally, but long longitudinally as well, um, or hair samples um, would be helpful because it looks at longer term cortisol um, than potentially um, saliva can or blood. Um, and then I think it's important to consider the levels of stress in the home in prevention and intervention efforts and how that might influence families' abilities to um, change behaviors in the long term. Um, and so in conclusion, um, we've said, I've said this a few times, but parenting stress wasn't associated, associated, oh, associated with um, overweight and obesity among preschoolers in this study. Um, but parenting stress may be an underlying behavior associated with unhealthful behaviors in young children. And so it um, definitely uh, warrants further exploration. And the results from this study, I hope, will help inform future interventions as well as more research exploring um, the relationship between parenting stress and child weight studies. Status. Any questions? I hope that gives time. <laughs>
um, published 2015 BMC Pediatric, or no, Canadian Journal of Public Health. Um, the Parents and Tots Together program actually did reduce parenting stress. And so it's a parent program that actually is focused on general parenting behaviors that embeds healthy rate related behaviors in it. And so we don't talk specifically about, um, it's not a weight reduction program at all. It's just promoting healthy behaviors because parents seem to be really interested in how do I discipline my child? How do I interact with my child in positive ways? So the Parents and Tots Together program is one that I can think of off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrin. Okay, now we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Kim Rain. Um, Dr. Rain is a, the scientific director at the Center for Health and Nutrition. She's also professor and associate dean at the School of Public Health at the University of Al Alberta, and she's also a very nice person. So please welcome <laughs> me and welcome in Kim Rain. And you're a really nice person too, JP. <laughs> So if you came here to see John McGavick, I'm really sorry. You've got me instead. Um, so I'm going to try to fill in and talk about social determinants of pediatric obesity. And I'm specifically going to look at an area that is in my expertise, and that is food environments. Um, thankfully, uh, Catherine has already talked about some of the social factors influencing physical activity, which uh, I think John would have built upon. So. Okay, in terms of disclosure, I will just uh, um, declare that I do have several grants that have supported this work and other work from Alberta Innovates, from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, from CIHR, and from Heart and Stroke, um, and uh, no conflicts of interest. So when we talk about the determinants of healthy eating, and this is, this is actually a very old paper that I'm quoting here, but healthy eating is, is, is very much a complex behavior. And very often, um, you know, traditionally, we have thought about it as an individual behavior and that everyone's you know, choices are indeed individual. You know, we choose what, what to put into our mouths. However, behavior is not something that is done in isolation, it is not done in a vacuum, it is done within the context of our environment. So I'm going to focus on those environments today. And so in terms of environments, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, you know, my environment is making me eat certain things. Um, but it becomes a little bit more easy to understand the um, implications um, and what those environments mean when we when we categorize those environments, and, and uh, several reviews, um, including mine and, and uh, a more recent review looking at pediatric obesity by Brennan et al., um, have looked at the in, uh, environments as physical, you know, what's available to us, um, the economic, how much does it cost, or does our income influence our behavior, sociocultural, what are the norms and values here? Uh, communication, what messages are we receiving? And political, what are the rules, what are the policies that are influencing our behaviors? So I'm going to break this down a little bit. Um, Leah Miniker uh, did this uh, excellent report on food environments in Canada a few years back for Health Canada. And, uh, really demonstrated that food environments do indeed shape the availability, affordability, and social acceptability of food and nutrition. Again, choices in quotes. Um, and the there is an association between food environments and diet-related outcomes, including obesity. In terms of the physical environment, what, uh, again, physical environment is what's available to us. And just to give you an idea of what that could look like, um, you know, we did a, a, a recent examination of food environments um, in uh, Alberta and found that over 75% of schools in the cities, Edmonton and Calgary, um, have at least one convenience store or fast food outlet within 500 meters. So, you know, kids are on their way to school and have um, uh, easy access to uh, traditionally, you know, junk type foods. And we have seen research, and this is not out of our lab, but out of Jason Gilliland's lab at uh, Western, um, looking at uh, that walk space around schools has an influence both on physical activity patterns and when there are things like fast food outlets and convenience stores within that walk space around schools, that it actually has an influence on children's BMI. So 
I want to talk a little bit about the nutrition report card that um, Alberta has uh, published for the past two years. It's a report card on food environments for children and youth. And um, so this will help me to explain those food environments in a little bit more detail and so the status, at least in the province of Alberta. So what the report card is all about is it assesses Alberta's current food environment and nutrition policies, and the aim is to increase awareness and a focus on health promotion and obesity prevention, and help people to understand that food environments are indeed influencing our, again, in quotes, choices. Um, and this uh, report card serves as a tool to identify areas that can require action to improve environments. Just to give you a little bit of a history, it was inspired by Mark Tremblay and <laughs> the participation uh, physical activity report card, which has 11 years now, 12. 12 years now. And so we've had two, so they were a decade ahead of us and, and, and um, um, uh, really, really were inspired by this work and recognized the need for uh, something to happen in the nutrition area to identify uh, what was going on there as well. And there was a publication uh, led by uh, Dana Olstead, who's here today as well, on development of this report card. And basically, we used the environmental framework by Brennan with the five environments that I've mentioned to come up with a series of indicators and benchmarks where we could gain uh, publicly uh, available data and uh, report on those environments. So just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, for 2016, for the entire province of Alberta, we actually had a D, so not particularly good. Our food environments are definitely in need of change. Um, so I've already uh, um, mentioned that uh, the in terms of the physical environment, we had you know, over 75% of schools in Edmonton and Calgary with at least one convenience store or fast food outlet within 500 meters. Um, so that's one of, one, of the, one of the areas, but we also looked at, for example, what is the environment within certain um, uh, types of facilities, such as recreation facilities, schools, etc. And we've had a lot of work in Alberta and elsewhere in Canada as well in trying to improve the food environments in schools, and yet we did a principal survey and asked um, principals whether or not um, what percentage of the foods in their schools met the definition of choose most often foods based on the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. And um, we found that um, only 40% said most of those foods, which would have been over 75% of choose most often, which was our benchmark for our report card. And 4% um, and, uh, said they um, completely met those guidelines. So we're only looking at approximately half of the schools meeting the guidelines that have been in place now for um, several years. So what we ended up doing then is uh, our benchmark was approximately 75% of foods available in schools are healthy. It was only somewhat met because only 50% of schools. Um, we do have policies in place to support it. Uh, so our grade for the schools was a C, so a little bit higher than the average for the um, uh, overall food environment, but still not as good as it could be considering the efforts that have gone into improving those environments. In terms of the communication environment, um, again, the, the communication environment is where do our food and nutrition messages come from, and um, children are definitely exposed to persuasive unhealthy food and beverage marketing through multiple avenues, whether it be on television, on the internet, Facebook, whatever it may be. Um, but we, some of the other indicators that we used in this area were around nutrition education and training providing to provided to teachers and child care workers, and um, our benchmark was that nutrition education and training is a requirement for teachers and child care workers, and it is not at all met. However, there are, there um, are policies that are starting to be put in place that will improve this, so we gave them a little bit of, uh, of wiggle room and, again, a final grade of a D. Um, however, kids are receiving nutrition education in schools. Uh, so um, we uh, had a little bit of a higher um, grade for that, a B. There is nutrition education at all, at all levels of the curriculum. Uh, so the interesting thing is, is that in schools, kids are being taught about nutrition, but the environment within the schools is not necessarily reflecting what they're being taught. And that's uh, you know, an inconsistency. 
And this is not part of our report card, but I have to shamelessly promote it because the work of Monique Pop Van Kent in um, the uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation looking at the exposure of kids to unhealthy advertising on internet. Kids are spending almost eight hours of day, a day in front of screens, so more than what we saw in the previous presentation. But in the top 10 kids' websites, there were 25 million ads for foods and beverages in one year, and 90% of those are for unhealthy products. So it is out there um, and, and definitely an, an issue to be concerned about. In terms of the economic environment, what we're looking at here is healthy food affordable. And, uh, you know, so one of the things we did is compare the cost of a nutritious food basket in Alberta to social assistance food allowances. And the cost of a nutritious food basket was almost double what uh, someone on um, uh, supports for independence would be receiving for uh, their, their food uh, budget. So that's not a good thing. Uh, but one way that you could potentially mitigate the, the um, it's not the high cost of food, but it's the low income that, um, that uh, prevents purchase of healthy food, um, is providing things like a subsidized fruit and vegetable subscription program in schools. And uh, there are certainly in some schools where they're attempting to do this on their own. And uh, so we did give uh, a little bit of credit for that. Um, but it is not something that is universal. It is not something that there is a policy for. So we had a, a, a D plus for, for, for this. Um, in terms of the social environment, um, there was a several sessions yesterday on weight bias and discrimination. So one of the things that we were looking at in our report card is whether or not children are being treated equally with respect to their body weight. And our um, indicator was that weight bias should be avoided. And we uh, had a benchmark that weight bias is explicitly addressed in schools and childcare settings. And it is not at all. So there was an F given for this. So there's lots of room to do. Um, there's, there's work in schools on anti-bullying and such, um, and, but weight bias is not an explicit aspect of that. In terms of the political environment, we're looking at rules, policies, and such. And you know, as I mentioned um, uh, when I was talking about the school uh, environment, we do indeed have um, something called the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. We've had these since about 2008, so uh, almost a decade now. Um, and these are guides for schools, recreation facilities, and for child care centers. So it's a good thing that we have those. Um, and so indeed, we um, gave an A to the political environment in terms of this one particular indicator that there is an evidence-based food rating system and dietary guidelines for food served to children and tools to support their applications. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've had this since uh, 2008. The challenge, however, is actually implementing them. And that's where we're seeing the uh, um, uh, inadequate uh, uh, implementation throughout. Um, good news is, is that recently in Alberta, there has been an announcement by the government of a, uh, um, a um, school meal program to be offered to high risk, i.e. low income schools. And so we're seeing this as an encouraging thing. Ideally, we'd like to see this as something that being un being as being universal, um, um, even something like a fruit and vegetable subscrip subscription program rather than an entire meal. But it is a step in the right direction. There um, is uh, a move towards developing policy to support healthy eating for kids in, in schools. So I'm going to just conclude then by talking about um, uh, uh, this is a quote from the uh, Lancet Obesity Series that was published back in 2015. And I, I definitely think we do need to rethink and reframe obesity when it comes to the idea of prevention. And um, you know, as increasing evidence links rates of obesity to changes in environments, we do need to develop healthy public policy um, as a key intervention strategy. And to quote, obesity is a complex issue halting and then reversing the obesity pandemic by changing our societal approach to food, beverages, and physical activity is not an optional choice or a target that can be missed. It is one of the most important challenges that must be tackled collectively by our civilizations. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I think we have uh, yeah, four or five minutes of questions. 
So lot, lots of time. Any questions for Kim? Yes. Not that, not that I'm aware of, nope. It, that's a really great idea. Um, you could develop that and make a lot of money. <laughs> Other question, yes. No, that's definitely um, a limitation. And with the report card, we actually had 44 different indicators. And because we're doing it on an annual basis, um, we are collecting as much as we can uh, data that are publicly available from sources such as a research project that has gone on. Um, and so we're using the best available data. Uh, obviously, uh, I, I would suggest that the principal survey is perhaps um, painting a better picture than what is actually happening because, you know. <laughs> so what we're actually doing now is we've been funded for another five years to continue the report card. So we will have a report card right through to 2021. And in that, however, we're also expanding the data collection so that it's not just um, an overview of what's happening in the province. We're engaging um, individual communities to um, be able to collect data about their own community so that they can actually have a, a mini report card for their own community and use that to advocate for changes. So we have even have um, developed a, um, a handheld data collection tool so you can take your smartphone and you can go to a recreation facility, you can take a picture of the um, vending machine and then it go, it's uploaded to our uh, software. So um, it's enabling us to drill down and look more closely at what's going on. But you know, I think for the overall report card, having a, a, a general consensus of what's going on is, is not a bad way to go. It's a huge question. Um, I think the best people to answer that are people in schools, but what we have heard is, uh, first of all, things like money. People think that it is going to, um, well, I, I, this, is, this is something I've heard specifically in a, in a recreation facility um, uh, context, but I think would apply to schools as well, is people don't want to get rid of uh, things like vending machines that have unhealthy products because they actually bring money in to the, um, to the schools um, or the recreation facilities. And, and there are still many schools um, throughout Canada that uh, do have contracts with um, uh, you know, a vendor and a certain percentage of the sales of their products will actually go to fund school councils and that sort of thing. So money is always the first excuse, um, yet most of the data that we have seen in terms of when you go in and work with um, a facility and promote a healthier choice that is also there to, for purchase, that it doesn't have any effect on the bottom line. But that's a good excuse. Another thing is time. You know, it, when, like, we're from the, I'm from the health sector, and, and I think it's really important for schools, recreation facilities, child cares, whatever, communities, low, uh, in entire municipalities, to, to prioritize health in their agenda, but it's not the top thing on the agenda of a school. Education is. So I think the, there's, there's a couple ways to, um, to work around that. One is there's a growing body of research that's indicating that kids who have healthy diets actually perform better um, in schools. And using that as your lever as opposed to, well, 
of course you want it to be healthier. Well, you know. <laughs> so, and then time and facilities are another issue. Um, a lot of schools were built without um, any type of food preparation facilities, may not have refrigeration, you know, all of that kind of thing. So all of those are, are factors that are influencing that. Okay, thank you. We'll stop here. Thank you very much, Kim. We we'll move on to the third speaker. And the final speaker will be Leah Miniker. Dr. Miniker is an assistant professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo and an affiliated scientist at the Propel Center for Population Health Impact. She received a PhD in public health from the University of Alberta in 2013 and currently holds a Canadian Cancer Society Research Institute Career Development Award in Cancer Prevention. She is interested in public health, nutrition, um, especially around retail food environment interventions like healthy corner stores, for example, uh, and using urban planning practice to create healthy cities. Please join me in welcoming Leah. Thanks. Okay. After Kim. <laughs> Maybe that's the mic. Okay. So, um, these are strawberries from my Kitchener Farmer's Market, where I live, where I love going. Um, partly because food is more than just nutrition, which I'll talk a little bit about. Here are my disclosure sides. So I have some money from CCFRI, which I'm very grateful for, um, and also the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And I don't think there's potential for conflicts of interest because of those two things. So my first, actually, slide is a question for you. And I uh, actually did my PhD with Kim, under Kim, and I am not uh, a registered dietitian. And so that's my also part of my disclosure. <laughs> so my question for you who are dietitians or who are people who consider yourself to be experts in nutrition are what is a healthy diet for kids? So just like anything that pops into your mind that's a healthy diet for kids, what would you say? Lots of fruits and vegetables, what else? Fiber? Variety? Sorry? Cooked at home, okay. Yep, variety? Sorry? A few treats thrown in to show balance, yeah. Okay, so these are all things that you'd probably hear no matter what healthcare professional you went to in Canada, I think. Or probably most of them would say similar things to what we've just heard. How do your patients or your friends or your family or your kids' teachers or other people in society talk about what makes up a healthy diet for kids? Low fat, Low fat okay. <laughs> Sorry? Yep, yeah, so sh reduced sugar. Organic, yes. Non processed. Non -processed. <laughs> so and when you think about the difference between what people say about their kids, which people are often more, much more careful about what their kids eat than what they themselves eat, um, this, I think the organic one is really interesting that you probably wouldn't hear from a doctor or a registered dietitian to tell you to eat an organic diet to be more healthy. You do hear that from a lot of parents, right? Oh, I only feed my kid organic stuff. I only feed my kid local stuff. That's another one, right? Like, it's, so it's kind of this like, it's different between what the evidence says and what sort of the, the common perception is. So what this presentation is ultimately about is frames. And Kim mentioned frames already, and there's been a few other presentations that have talked about reframing obesity, reframing diet, reframing food. So what we have heard here at this conference so far today and what we will continue to hear about are things like, does anyone know what this is? I Googled it. It's a fatty acid, that's an omega-3 fatty acid, according to Dr. Google. <laughs> so things like getting your essential vitamins and nutrients. What about blood glucose? That's something that we've heard about in some of the presentations, right? Pre-diabetes, diabetes, different comorbidities associated with obesity. And hormones, hormone regulation, and how different factors influence, you know, hormone, hormones which can influence our weight gain or weight loss or uh, behaviors. So this is sort of a biomedical view of obesity. Then there's everyone else in the world who's not here at this conference. And they think about things like eating together with your family and enjoying your family time over dinner. 
They think about things like what's good for the planet. So what, how can I eat a diet that might, be, that might reduce my carbon footprint? What about money? What about your local economy? What about going to your farmer's market so you can support your local farmers and your local food producers? And what about ethics of eating? So here's a little guy with a little devil and angel on one side. So when you talk to a lot of people who, can, who follow a vegan diet or a vegan diet, often it's about ethics, right? It's about, I, I don't buy you know, meat because I don't think it's ethical to harm a sentient creature to eat a protein source that I don't actually need to eat. Um, or thinking about people who are like, well, I don't eat bananas because the banana industry is horrible and people, you know, Monsanto and this kind of thing. So people use ethics also to inform their healthy eating. And finally, there's taste. And when you add sugar, salt, and fat to things, they taste better. And so I think that's another important thing that we as people who really, really care about health or, di or um, nutrition sometimes don't like to acknowledge. Um, that things, when you, when you add junk to them, they, they just taste better because that's how we've evolved over time, right? To seek out these sources because our ancestors didn't have great access to those things that have keep, kept us alive. So the other thing that I wanna talk about in thinking about how we look at pictures is when we focus um, in our day-to-day -day work, often we are focused, we, we look through a microscope at our own particular issue. So for me, in my microscope, I have retail food environments. I have things like healthy corner stores and uh, interventions in the retail environment to sort of nudge people to, to purchase healthier foods. How do you assess the retail food environment? How do you work with planners to create cities that actually promote access to healthy foods? That's, that's in my microscope. You might have hormones in your microscope or the microbiome or parents and kids and parenting stress in your microscope. So what I hope this presentation does is actually encourages you for just a few minutes to take a step back from your own microscope and look through a telescope for a minute. And this is what the next couple of slides will, will hopefully do. So many of you have already seen this map and I've only ever seen this obesity systems map at conferences for like two seconds, which is I'm, what I'm gonna do here today, saying it's complex and then everyone moves on. <laughs> um, but when we think about, even though this is like a very complex systems map and you have all sorts of influences and drivers of different kinds of behaviors and there's this energy balance in the middle, um, it's still kind of a microscopic view. So what I'm talking about right now is food and food and obesity, that kind of link can still be fairly microscopic. So if you look at, for example, food availability, which is in there, or food marketing, that's kind of still one issue. Here's another systems map, and I think this is a bit more of a binocular kind of view of it. So this is by, uh, led by a colleague of mine, Shannon Majewitz from University of Waterloo, who got together a bunch of us who do food research at University of Waterloo. Um, and so this was published in BMC Public Health last year. And you can't also see this one, but at the very top here you see obesity. So what this paper was about, which I thought was really kind of cool, was about food and health. And right now we're talking about food and health as it pertains to obesity, but there's food and health, food and public health issues as they pertain to food allergy, as they pertain to food insecurity, as it pertains to dietary contaminants, and infectious foodborne illness. And so what this paper sought to do is, you know, sometimes when we in public health make recommendations about food allergies, so no kids in Ontario at any school are allowed to bring peanuts to school. And then if there's any kids with you know, uh, additional allergies like to sesame or to citrus or to wheat or whatever, kids in that class can't bring it. So that's called Sabrina's Law in Ontario. So what are the implications of allergy policies on chronic disease prevention? Because peanuts are actually a good source of fat and protein which kids need, right? And it's also low, it's pretty inexpensive. So if you're food insecure, so these recommendations that we make within public health can sometimes undermine other food and health food and public health issues, which I think is important. And so this is kind of why I say this is a bit more of a binocular look. So instead of just looking up at our one particular issue, take a step back and look at food and health overall. And then here's a food systems map. And I think this is a bit more of a telescopic view. So we have at the top farming, and then at the side, uh, the right side, economic, and then the bottom, social. And social is where that whole obesity systems map and that whole food and health map that I just showed would fit as one piece of the social um, outcomes, if you can call them that, of our food system. And then at the other side, we have the environment. 
and biological systems in the world around us. So in October, I started a new position. I was um, doing public health, public health, public health, public health in my life. And then I started a new position in October at the University of Waterloo in the School of Planning. So now I'm teaching urban planners who are going to be graduating in four years or five years and becoming registered professional planners. So now I'm teaching them about health and planning. And so how we design our cities matters for every outcome you can think of. Inter it matters for our diet to a small ex smaller extent than like things like social inclusion, things like physical activity for sure, um, utilitarian transportation, those kinds of things. It really matters how we build our cities. And the, the course, the one course in my school right now that, I'm, that I've just finished teaching is in fourth year. So by the time they've learned everything they're gonna learn, my job is to say, and by the way, everything you do for the rest of your life in your job will affect people's health. So I think it should be a little bit earlier in, the, in their education, but I'll work on it. Uh, so I'm also in the Faculty of Environment, not in the Faculty of Health Studies, which is so interesting. Because now I'm talking to a bunch of people who work on food issues, nothing to do with health, nothing to do with individual health or nutrition. So this is, these are some this is some information from some of my colleagues who work in the Faculty of Environment. A third of greenhouse gas emissions come from agricultural productions. And climate change is a big problem, a big problem, and it will affect all of us, right? Fake so this news. is fake, fake news, yeah. <laughs> fake news, okay. <laughs> I was wondering when Trump would come up. Um, <laughs> large scale agriculture also impacts biodiversity, soil, water, and air quality. And so some of my colleagues are doing work with, you know, monoculture crops and how when you have miles upon square miles of or kilometers upon square kilometers of one kind of crop, what does that do if you, if you get a, some sort of pest or some sort of disease? How does that impact food security for the whole, um, for within the food system? Agriculture also is Alberta's second largest industry. So there is a lot, a lot, a lot of money to be made. And if you start talking about, so this is another thing I discovered recently, um, beef is probably like the worst in terms of environmental impact that you can consume. Um, beef and cheese are like up there in terms of environmental degradation when you consume those. And we're in Alberta. And we lived in Alberta for five years and Alberta beef is like the thing. So how do you say that in a province like Alberta, right? How do you, when you have powerful, powerful um, industry interests and you have billions of dollars being made, how does that impact what kinds of messages are being, are you, you, that you're able to say? Okay. Then finally, economic power can be translated into political power. So if you have, for example, if Coke decides we are going to reduce the sugar in our products, in our regular Coke products, by a third, because people can't really tell the difference, so we're just gonna do that, and we're gonna market the hell out of it so that people will buy it more, so they increase their market power. Is that a win for public health? If you concentrate political power within one food company, is that actually a win for public health, even if you're reducing sugar consumption? I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. It depends, again, on your frames. It depends on what's really important. Is it important that we have competition? Is it important that we have small businesses? Um, which, you know, social determinants of health would say that, yeah, it's really important. Uh, economics and economic equality is really important. Or is it all about sugar? And I, I can't answer that. So coming to this next point, <laughs> which is that when you think about these kinds of issues sometimes, it can be a little depressing. So these, because these issues are so complex and they're so much beyond what we, um, what we as, one, as one person can do, it, you can sometimes despair a little bit. So what does this mean then? For th so here's my depressing photo. And what I want to do for the remaining couple of minutes uh, that I have is to talk about what's one example of what thinking about like a complex systems would do for one policy example in this country right now. So, in 1942, Canada's first official food rules came out. And this was about uh, making sure that people weren't dying of scurvy and rickets and, I don't know if you die from rickets, but you know, getting enough of the things that you need to make sure you don't die. Now, we have in 2011 was the last one, we have more of a sort of holistic chronic disease prevention, also nutrition adequacy, um, but more, there's a little bit more about chronic disease prevention in there as well. And as we, as you probably all know, it's also right now, Canada's Food Guide is undergoing 
renovations, uh, and they'll be coming out with a new one soon. So here's an article, Canada's Food Guide Update Needs to Address Sustainability. So what would Canada's Food Guide look like if there was something in there about a healthy diet is one, like in what they say in Brazil, healthy diets derived from socially and environmentally sustainable food systems. What would that do to our food system in Canada? What would that do to our, the way we recommend diets to people? If we actually talked about plant-based plant -based proteins rather than you know, low-fat proteins. Um, so in Brazil, and this has already been mentioned, I think, by Hassan yesterday, about um, how they've been talking about it. They, t they talk about minimally processed foods, uh, limiting and avoiding ultra-processed ultra foods, and always preferring natural or minimally processed and freshly made dishes and meals to ultra-processed foods. So a couple of final thoughts. If this happened, we have to recognize that the Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion, it's right in their name. Their mandate is in their name. Their mandate as a, as a governmental organization is not to promote ecological sustainability. So they can't do this by themselves. They need input from many, many sectors. I think it's really important for us to take a step back from our microscopes every now and then and to think about our responsibilities to our colleagues here and not just the professionals here and people who work in obesity prevention or treatment or management, but also the patient engagement committee. What are, wh how are what we gonna do? So yesterday, Jimena um, talked about public health and weight stigma and weight bias and that kind of thing, which I think is really important as a public health person for me to go forward and think about how what I'm saying about food and obesity is going to impact people living with obesity. And what are our ultimate goals? So is it that everyone consumes less sugar? Or is it that people can enjoy time with their family and eat a healthy meal even if they have dessert? And finally, opportunities to reach out to broaden our work and to place our work in the context of this broader um, food system. These, these opportunities exist, but it, it, they're not necessarily immediate and they're not within our own job descriptions and they're not within our own mandates necessarily. So I think we need to be bold and we need to seize these opportunities when they exist and to collaborate which also requires us to be humble about our own expertise and be willing to learn from our colleagues and others. And that's it. Questions for Leah? So I think when you make pol like when you make these interdisciplinary policies, when you make policies about food, you have to have communication between nutrition and agriculture, right? I don't know, and because I don't work in the federal government, I don't know the whole history of the, all the players involved. I don't know who's more, who takes bigger weight, but I imagine that there's probably some battles that go on, probably some big battles, right, that go on. So I don't, I don't, and I don't know how that all works out, but I think, yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's a difference between the kids that I teach who are planning, pl planners, because at the moment they're still, I think, pretty ideological. They still care about things. They, they <laughs> acknowledge. Their spirit hasn't been crushed yet. I don't know, their spirit hasn't been crushed yet. Um, <laughs> you know, I think what I hear from my colleagues who are planners is that um, it's the developers who are the big battles. Um, because there's city planners and there's regional planners, but there's also planners who work for developers. And so those are the people who are like, the bottom line is what's important because that's their job. Um, so, but the, the kids that I teach, so it's, it's also interesting because it's cross-listed between planning and health. So I'm teaching the health kids about planning and I'm teaching the planners about health. So it's a bit of a challenge to kind of like make the uh, connections, but the planners really actually are, are super interested in how what they're gonna do impacts health. And basically what it comes down to is compact urban design, grid pattern streets, highly walkable, that 
fixes air quality, it fixes mental health, it fixes utilitarian transportation. Like, so there's kind of like a few solutions that can fix a whole host of problems. Um, so yeah, but no, they're, they're really interested and I just need to make them, I need to let my director talk to the, let me talk to the first years when they come in so I can convince them just how important it is, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Susan. We've got a session in here, uh, but uh, thank you very much. And just some closing remarks. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the, the speakers, the attendees. Don't forget to fill out your assessment. I assume they're online. I'm not sure. And now there's a Pecha Kucha at 11 in this room. So if you want to stay and for the judges to stay here for, for that. So thank you very much again. So we're over time. You can't clap anymore. It's done. <laughs> Uh, for people who are staying for the Pecha Kucha, if the judges and presenters could just come on up to the front, that would be good. And for everyone staying, uh, please stay. They'll be really fun. And we'll start really soon.